I think Woody had a lot to do with bringing them back to that to that raw and vital feel, you know, because Woody is very incendiary. I mean, he has a kind of personality that just glows and everything around him catches fire. There is something vital in his personality that is and, and about the way he plays that goes beyond technique if you would. There is that which makes Ronnie Ronnie, his personality, imbues the Stones with a vitality that they had been missing for a long time. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the Glimmer Twins, uh, Nick and Keith, are very, but you know, they've been together, they know each other, it's, a, it's like an old marriage, you know. And uh, so fi it was kind of like you know, one of the guests at the wedding 30 years ago <laughs> came and reminded them how much they loved each other, <laughs> you know, and that brought the music and the magic together. If Wood was key in revitalizing the band in the studio, it was Jagger who provided the album's creative drive. Like John Lennon before him, he had made New York his home base in 1976, and have been soaking up the city's extremes of squalor and decadence and its many flourishing artistic movements. New music in particular was thriving. Emanating from the seismic influence of Andy Warhol in the mid to late 60s, in the Lower East Side the city had developed its own punk movement, which both predated and inspired its British counterpart. Whereas further north in Manhattan, Studio 54 had opened its doors in 77 to a heady mix of disco, celebrity and cocaine. The album, Some Girls, may have been recorded in Europe, but at its heart were the distinctive sounds and stories of New York City, all filtered through the mind of Mick Jagger. In the mid-70s, New York essentially was going bankrupt, and the city seemed out of control. You know, suddenly the whole graffiti thing was happening, so every time a train rolled into the station, it was just covered in graffiti, and there just seemed to be a sense of, you know, this town is turning into... Um, you know, kind of jungle in a way. You know, there was a, a sense of uh, the streets being very raw. You know, every single union in the city went on strike for months for one reason or another. And, you know, finally there was, uh, you know, this, the economic problems that the city was having. You know, there was a famous New York Daily News cover about uh, President Gerald Ford saying, you know, Ford to city, drop dead. You know, it's just like, we're not going to rescue New York. And there was a sense of New York, um, you know, in its own way, kind of teetering on the brink of uh, real collapse. As often happens, I mean, as New York was in that kind of danger, it kind of was going through a strange artistic flourishing. I mean, punk rock was happening, disco was happening, you know, the early stirrings of hip hop were happening. The energy of the city is coming from its kind of artistic community. And all of that is reflected in some girls, you know, walk in Central Park, creeping after dark, people think I'm crazy, you know, that sense of, you know, the danger of what New York is. And that's, you know, the great sort of thing about Jagger. I mean, as much as people say, you know, well, he's a socialite, you know, he's removed. When the Stones announced their 1975 tour, you know, they did it on a flatbed truck that went up Fifth Avenue. It got, a, again, a lot of attention to New York City. And if you look at Mick Jagger's outfit, he's wearing these jeans and his left pant leg is rolled up. That was a, that's a bike messenger fashion, you know, so that, your, so that your pant leg didn't get caught in the chain of your bike. And, you know, people were picking up on that, like on the street. And there's Mick Jagger, like, picking up on it. It was not, you know, it wasn't something that people were doing at Studio 54. But it was just such a cool kind of gesture. That's the kind of New York, I think, that that Jagger presents. I think Some Girls, in many ways, is primarily Mick Jagger's record. And that's the vision of New York. You know, on the one hand, you know, am I hard enough? Am I tough enough? Am I rich enough? You know, in Beast of Burden. And at the same time, you know, the guy who's distraught and walking through Central Park in the middle of the night um, in Miss You, you know, you're getting both sides of, of, of what New York City is. Because Jagger, I think, felt comfortable moving in both those worlds. Do you ever go and see other bands? Oh, yeah. Like who? Who do you like? 
Well, I mean, when, most of the time in New York, I go around sort of clubbing, you know, a lot of nights of the week, Thursdays and Fridays. But, I mean, I just see every new band there is. I mean, lists and lists and lists. Some of them are not very good, but some of them are. I see New York on the cover of some girls. To start with, there's a sort of Warholian iconoclasm taking some of those faces of celebrities and then doing something, you know, rather punkish with them. So straight away, that felt much more New York than London. There's this image, stereotypical image of Mick, who loves expensive cuisine, expensive girls. But I remember a quote from Ian Stewart, who basically said that Mick just organises everything. You know, Keith was out there, crashed out under the sofa quite a lot of the time. Mick really held it together, and he particularly held it together through some girls. This was a vital period when, you know, Keith had had his bust as well. And he really had his work cut out. I mean, to the point of getting Ronnie to teach him bits on the guitar as well. I mean, he actually, it was real hands-on kind of stuff. So I think that Jagger does have to take enormous credit for that throughout the, whole, the band's whole career, actually, but particularly this period where they were potentially quite vulnerable. And with Jagger at the helm, the first single from the album displayed a brazen disregard for the band's vulnerability and plunged them headfirst into disco. An underground musical phenomenon that had been seeping into the mainstream since the mid-70s, Jagger had been sampling the scene firsthand at Studio 54, where his wife Bianca had become the unofficial queen of the club. Although it had been dismissed out of hand as a musical fad by certain parts of the rock community, in 1977 the film Saturday Night Fever had become a nationwide sensation. A major part of its appeal were the hit songs contributed to the soundtrack by the Bee Gees, which marked the first successful fusion of disco and rock, and the Rolling Stones released Miss You, hot on the heels of these developments. The single became their first US number one since 1973's Angie. I remember when the bass line went disco, I was like, hmm, that's different, especially for the Stones. I'm like, I'm going to play disco? Okay, that'll work. And um, when we hit the groove, I, I understood that um, they were trying to incorporate uh, the tradition with a new tradition, introducing blues harmonica into um, a disco groove. And, hey, I think it was a great idea, you know, because, I mean, I've, I've always been a fan of disco, and I'm definitely a blues man. Well, hey, it, it, it's evident, you know, um, in hindsight, that it was genius, you know, because it became the hit of 78. I mean, you know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't go anywhere and not hear that song. Disco was the first time since the twist when every leading artist felt compelled or was compelled to record a song in that style. And so just as you had Frank Sinatra sing Everybody's Twist in, which is ridiculous, of course, he survived, people <laughs> moved on and went back to their regular lines of work, but everybody hit the reefs on disco. Elton John put out a disco 12-inch flop, Aretha Franklin disco record, nobody needed it. Uh, but the Stones put out Miss You. Part of the reason they got away with it is because Mick was always into the R&B rhythms and dance steps. And in that song, Miss You, he very cleverly used the falsetto that Barry Gibb had popularized. It's incredible to think of Mick Jagger learning from the Bee Gees, but he saw how popular those records were. And, uh, and Miss You, he's great with his falsetto. Miss You is a coherent song. It's about something. And that's important. Um, he could take with him a lot of people who weren't dance fans just because it's a coherent song. 
And secondly is he has this uh, androgynous character, which he'd always had, but is particularly appropriate for disco in the late 70s. Disco really did spring out of the gay and Puerto Rican clubs, and it was a, a flamboyant music. Being a dance-based movement, it favored people who looked good and could move well. Well, this is something that Jagger had already done. He proved he could do this in the 60s. And he could be gay without scaring straight people. And the reason he could be gay without scaring straight people was because he was so sexualized, he covered more of the prism than your average person. And so he would naturally incorporate elements of this uh, into his uh, artistry and, um, and sound convincing doing it, which is very important because you don't want to think he's a tourist. Uh, but even though he's sounding convincing, he's not at all disturbing. When I left Europe, I remember going back to uh, New York and my little brother, who's like, you know, hardcore Harlemite kid, you know, from the hood, in the hood, all about the hood. And he was saying, Jimmy, because that's the name my mom called me, uh, gave me when I was uh, born, said, man, you got to hear this record by the Rolling Stones, man. He said, man, they got some bad harmonica player on there, man. You got to hear this, man. You're going to love this. <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, but when he told me this story, after I finished laughing and telling him it was me, it dawned on me how powerful a tune that this song was that it even made inroads into the heart of the black community. I don't know how anyone can not like Miss You. It's just one of the most incredibly vibrant pop singles of the 70s. Miss You was the first Stones masterpiece for a long time in the singles market, I think. Especially the 12-inch pink vinyl version, which just went on and on. And often those 12 inches were just awful. But this one, the riff was so good that beautiful texture of the sugar blue is harmonica the guy they found in the streets of Paris Jagger's vocals and Mick and uh, uh, Bill and Charlie right up front with the rhythm section it was just such a warm up-tempo lively this is the Stones not trying to be punk keeping up with the punks it was doing something different and actually it won them more fans by doing that than trying to out punk the punk bands which would have been a bit silly really it was it was a masterstroke Yet there was a punk influence on some girls, albeit not from those British bands that had been laughing at the Stones' excesses two years beforehand. The New York punk scene, which was inspired by a more conceptual approach to art and music, had as its forebears Andy Warhol and the band he helped launch, the Velvet Underground. Having developed in the early 70s through acts such as the New York Dolls and Suicide, it emerged as a recognizable movement in 1974, when young bands began to appear at the Lower East Side Club, CBGB. By 77, figureheads Patti Smith, Television, The Ramones and Blondie had all become underground celebrities, poised for mainstream success. And it was this raw and streetwise world that Jagger and the Stones managed to channel.